All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're pretty excited to do this one. It's a, a little bit different of a theme than the last web, last couple webcast Wednesdays we've done, um, where we're showcasing um, our brew pub in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, my name's Eric Fowler. I'm the education manager. Uh, Logan and Skylar, do you want to introduce yourselves real briefly? Hi, I'm Logan. I'm the baker here at White Labs. I'm Skylar, and I'm the head chef. Awesome. Um, as I mentioned before, for those of you that are just joining now, uh, we will be taking uh, Q&A at the end. Um, some people have submitted questions beforehand, so thank you for doing that. We'll try our best to get to it. Um, if you don't see us getting to it, just go ahead and resubmit the question uh, as well, and we will get to all those at the end. All right, so the outline of what we're going to be talking about today, um, we're going to be going through um, White Labs Brewing Company and Kitchen and Tap, which again is our full service brew pub in um, Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I'm calling in today from San Diego, um, and uh, Skyler and Logan are um, sitting in the restaurant. So uh, we'll talk about the organisms that we love from beer to bread, um, really everything fermentation. So this one's um, a little creative, and we've seen uh, a, a big uprising and trend in uh, people creating sourdough starters and um, home food fermentations as well as beer fermentation. So we hope to be able to uh, kind of connect both worlds and um, talk about what organisms um, have similarities and maybe some of the differences in, in uses for similar organisms. And then incorporating uh, fermentation into everyday diets. So uh, Logan and Skyler are going to be talking about um, how they actually take fermentation and <clears throat> turn it into consumables. Um, and then at home ferments, which, you know, while some of you may be based locally uh, in Asheville, those of you who aren't, we'll kind of give you some tips and tricks and uh, review some recipes and tell you how you can uh, use some, some brewer's yeast and different types of bacteria at home. Uh, one thing that we like to say quite a bit is how much fermentation really permeates our everyday lives. So, when you wake up in the morning, uh, well, maybe lately my breakfast has been a little bit heavier working from home more often, but uh, you know, an, an average breakfast when you wake up in the morning, you might have uh, a bagel, a cup of yogurt and a cup of coffee, right? Those three products have some aspect of fermentation uh, that you've consumed before even walking out the door. So while a lot of the people on the beer side, you know, might realize that Saccharomyces cerevisiae is uh, a species of yeast that we use a lot in beer, you might not think about how it's used in beer in in uh, bread as well. Or if you're making a sour beer, kettle sour, how different types of lactobacillus that are used in brewing have actually been cultured and sourced from yogurt. Uh, in, in the case of coffee, uh, it actually undergoes um, generally a wild fermentation or spontaneous fermentation on the farm uh, to help kind of break down that fruit and make the bean more accessible as well as creating a lot of precursors for flavors. So, um, Hope to dive into that a little bit more. Um, Skylar, so did you want to tell us a little bit about um, Kitchen and Tap and uh, what you guys are doing out there? Yeah, so um, White Labs Kitchen and Tap, we try and incorporate as many of our um, yeast that we produce here into a fermentation focused menu. Um, a lot of the stuff we have on the menu right now is very preservation oriented. Um, so that's a lot of family style shared plates, um, sourdoughs and of course our Neapolitan pizza. Um, we kind of want to showcase what yeast can do and how that can transform the food that we eat today. Cool and with the uh, the current state of affairs um, what are some things you guys are still doing to um, have awesome food and fermentation focused food accessible to your uh, locality there? Yeah it's been um, kind of hard to implement the menu that we just put out, which is um, a lot more, say, fine dining based. Um, so we've been doing some smaller things and sticking to grocery items to go pizza doughs, um, a lot of Logan sourdough breads. Um, but we've been taking all the necessary precautions, sanitizing and wearing gloves and masks whenever exchanging with guests. So. Cool. And so another element that's always pretty awesome, um, you know, obviously in, in San Diego here, we have uh, a, a tasting room, but 
you know, once Kitchen and Tap was opened, I remember going out there when it was a shell of a building and uh, it was it was cool just to see the spark of what some of the things uh, that you guys were going to do, but you also showcase um, a yeast driven brewery, right? So um, not only is, is yeast and fermentation an aspect, a lot of the food that you're doing, um, you are able to have the same base of work um, side by side with different yeast strains. And I always think that's a pretty cool showcase as well. Uh, yeah. On the on the baking side, um, especially with the current state of affairs, Logan, what are some um, some things that you guys have been doing or some maybe ways that you've been tweaking uh, what you currently or what you usually put out on your menu? So, yeah, we've been doing a lot of takeaway breads. I've been making a lot of sourdough cinnamon rolls, cookies, brownies, things that people can take home to their family versus plate of desserts, which I usually do. Awesome. We, uh, we were doing an over the bar pairing here a couple years back and uh, one of my chef friends did some yeast risen cookies and it was the first time he'd ever done them and they were god awful. Uh, <laughs> so he, he went back and tweaked the recipe and they came out much, much better. But the first, uh, <laughs> the first he brought them to me, I was like, I'm sorry, I can't sell these. <laughs> it's so it's, it, it's cool to see that you guys are still, uh, you know, branching out because the, the obvious to me is always bread, right? Um, yeah. And buying nice loaves of bread, but it's always cool to see you doing different cinnamon rolls and that kind of stuff. Thank you. Uh, so first off, this, this picture is awesome. Um, Skylar, you want to tell us a little bit about what we're actually looking at here and then uh, maybe some of the, the overall process when it comes to fermenting food. Uh, if you have any specific examples, that's great. I know we'll kind of get through uh, kimchi and some different bread recipes in the upcoming slides. But uh, when you're just working at uh, a general pickling or fermentation, what you're looking at, and then what's the, uh, what's the board we're looking at here? Um, so starting at the top left there, we have a tomato jam that was made in house. Um, we're looking at some pickled okra, uh, house sauerkraut. Uh, we use the lactobreda strain for the sauerkraut. Um, some pickled jalapenos, pickled strawberries, and a fermented chow chow. Um, if you're not familiar with chow chow, it's kind of a Appalachian style um, fermented cabbage. I guess you could say that kimchi has, you know, influenced a lot of you know, various cultures. Um, we have some pickled bamboo shoots, a uh, house mortadella, and a house spam. We were doing a Hawaiian pop-up at the time, so those were the things that were readily available to us. Awesome. I actually think I was out there when you guys were doing some of that. I remember uh, you know, some different pork, and then I think it was uh, uh, a chicken or a game hen or something you guys were doing. Yeah, the little uh, spring chicken. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. That was, uh, that was a good visit. Um, okra is obviously pretty southern, too, so it's always rad to see that that on menu. So when you're, uh, when you're composing a board like this, uh, you mentioned some were pickled and some were fermented. Is everything going through fermentation or are you doing direct acidification and um, actually pickling some of these items as well? Uh, we do pretty much a direct acidification, uh, some hot pour over brines. Um, we like to lend a lot of creativity to the people that are working the station. So whoever is plating these ferment boards kind of has control of what goes on there as long as it tastes okay at the end of the day. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, when we're talking about the, the broad sense of fermentation too, uh, while, you know, the kind of note on the slide here, fermentation can pickle foods, but is pickling fermentation? Um, it's kind of a yes and no answer, right? So while you're not directly fermenting that dish, it does incorporate some aspect of fermentation. So that vinegar that you're pickling with has gone through fermentation, right? Uh, so it's kind of cool to see when, you know, again, talking about how much fermentation is involved on our everyday diet. Well, if you're having almost any condiment, there's probably vinegar in that, right? There's vinegar in, on your Heinz ketchup on your, your picnic table when you're having a burger but people aren't really thinking that there's some aspect of fermentation in that. You've got the bun that's fermented, right? Uh, well, most likely. <laughs> if it's a cheap store-bought bun, maybe not, but uh, 
has the potential of fermentation. Uh, you likely have cheese on there, which is uh, a pretty obvious uh, aspect of fermentation. And that's why I think this picture in your ferment board that you guys do is so cool because it uh, is something that's the, the root, the root of it is uh, you can, it's accessible at most restaurants, right? They're going to have cheese boards or charcuterie boards, but you're displaying it and representing it in uh, a very geeky uh, fermentation driven way, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, some of the notes on here, when you're looking at a brine, um, obviously salt is a key component. Uh, it's great for flavor, but it's great for stability as well. So similar to how uh, hops have some antimicrobial properties in beer, uh, salt is a great preservative too, and it's going to remove some of that moisture, which microbes, um, pathogens might prefer and make it more stable. And then also looking at uh, a fairly low pH. Um, 4.6 isn't really going to taste uh, super sour, but that 4.6 is, is a general range of where uh, pathogens begin to be inhibited. And that's, you know, really the organisms that are going to make you sick. So um, acidifying is great for flavor, but it's also very important for uh, preservation. Definitely. Uh, so reasons to ferment. So, uh, you know, we often talk and uh, I know we've all said it, but uh, people ask what White Lobs is and we're a lot of things, right? Uh, what you guys do day to day is very different than, than what I do, that what somebody in production in the propagation lab might do. Uh, so it's, it's always fun to kind of bring everybody together and talk about uh, the broader sense of uh, who White Lobs is and uh, what fermentation is and how much it can uh, play a role. But what it really comes back to is uh, the quickest answer being a flavor company, right? It's interesting to see how flavor and the selection of organisms and the way that they are utilized and the environments that they're utilized in can um, make such a difference. Uh, and we'll kind of get back and maybe you guys can touch on in um, one of the upcoming slides on some of the experiments you've done with different yeast strains when it comes to fermenting uh, different types of dough or foods. But uh, Skylar, could you touch a little bit on, you mentioned um, on the, the ferment board, really looking at um, stability, right? And, and looking at uh, being able to uh, preserve products. And what, what did you kind of mean by that? Well, um, preservation, that all comes from preserving the harvest. So I think in restaurants, sometimes we can get kind of lost um, and dissociated from, you know, the idea of having a garden and having all these things that we need to keep for a long time to make it through winter. Um, but that's something I really enjoy doing and I enjoy presenting and uh, utilizing in the kitchen and tap. Yeah, for sure. Um... It's obviously, you know, there's health benefits. When we're talking about baked goods, it's interesting because most fermentation uh, is a tool of preservation, um, really except when it comes to baked goods, right? Flour, uh, flavor aside, right? You, you don't want to sit on your flour for years and years and let it stale. But flavor aside, it's uh, a fairly stable product. Uh, grains can be fairly stable, but when you ferment it and bake it into bread, it's actually less stable, whereas everything else we're talking about uh, becomes more stable, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Flavor aside. Uh, what, uh, Logan, what's your experience with working with different types of fermentations and breads in um, building up different flavors through different strains um, and the general health benefits um, of working with different baked goods? Well, I'm a big fan of adding as much layers of flavor as possible. So like for my chocolate chip cookies, you know, they have brown butter and sourdough and rye flour and flaky mold and sea salt. And I think if you eat that versus just like a store-bought chocolate chip cookie, they're not even the same thing, really. So I think that different flowers and different leavening and all sorts of things just all come together and make a completely different product. 
Awesome. So that kind of brings us to um, baking at home. And if you could touch on what some different types of bread and pastries, again, uh, a lot of uh, my experience uh, working with you has been uh, a lot of on the bread side, but I see more and more often you're doing awesome cinnamon rolls and uh, as you said, cookies and uh, what's your experience been with uh, working with different types of fermentation? Um, you kind of mentioned a poolish um, offline and using different yeast strains. So if you kind of um, touch on that and maybe what the, uh, the proofing looks like of, of those doughs. Sure. So I, when I first started here, I made two sourdough starters. I have a white flour sourdough starter that is named Lucille. Nice and happy. Um, and then I have a rye sourdough starter that is named Ricky Rye Cardo. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what I like to put in chocolate chip cookies and cinnamon rolls because it's just it's really nutty and I don't know. I just, I love it. Um, so yeah, it's been fun to experiment. My sourdough starters here, I feel like are the happiest that I've ever had just because of all the funk in the air in our kitchen. Um, so it's been interesting to see how they work and survive and using them in different ways in breads, cookies, sourdoughs, cakes, all sorts of things. What's the, uh, what's the process of creating that starter? Um, and I guess it's kind of a three-part question. How do you maintain it? And when you're using those starters side by side, is there a difference in handling and proofing that you see between the two? Um, so it's just to start a sourdough starter, it's just flour and water. And you just let it sit and get funky and grow and deflate and grow again. And then you just start feeding it and it's almost like having a pet. So that's, I think that's why a lot of people have been experimenting with that now just because it's something that changes every day and you have to kind of keep up with it and as far as proofing goes um i bake my bread in the course of two days so i let it proof overnight in the fridge and then it gets a really nice tangy sour flavor and is easier to digest too as a result would you say that there is some truth to uh you know, San Francisco being famous for sourdough bread, like is there some terroir or regionality uh, to the organisms? For instance, in beer and wine, right? You get a lot of, uh, if you're doing a lot of wild and natural fermentations, uh, that vineyard or where your cool ship is in the case of beer uh, has different organisms in that environment and that inoculates that product differently, creating a different end result. Would you say through your experience, there's some truth to that with sourdough starters as well? Absolutely. I think that they thrive based on what's in the air. So a San Francisco sourdough starter versus a Portland, Maine sourdough starter would probably taste completely different. And then what are um, some general tips and tricks that people should be looking at if they're looking to create a starter at home? Um, what's the time frame that they're looking at uh, on creating it. I've seen, you know, again, a lot of people are very active on social media being at home uh, a lot more and trying to make starters. And a lot of people are having uh, a lot of failures when it comes to it and having to do a couple attempts. So what are some tips and tricks that maybe people could be looking at? I would say just paying attention to how it changes throughout the course of the day and try to maintain a pretty regular feeding schedule, try to feed it at the same time each day. I feed my dog at the same time every day. It's kind of the same. Um, and yeah, just watch it and put markers on your jar or whatever you're keeping it in to watch how it rises and falls and just take care of it. Love it. Awesome. Um, so, you know, one thing that you guys are becoming uh, more and more renowned for is the yeast risen uh, pizza dough. And, um, it's, I, you know, as unbiased as I can be every time I'm there, the, the pizza is amazing and, uh, the wood fire oven really adds a lot to it, but the dough is something that's unique and spectacular, uh, on its own. And recently I, I took the, the home scaled 
uh, recipe, which you can see the ingredients for here, which will be posting the, the full recipe um, after this webcast. Um, and I made it at home and it, it took three days to, to proof the whole thing. And as a, as a backup, because I had never made it before, uh, I bought some Trader Joe's, you know, pizza dough, which I'm sure a lot of people on this call have had before. And I've always enjoyed, uh, but I bought it as a backup and it ended up that the, the pizza dough and the recipe that you guys provided turned out awesome. Uh, but I made some garlic knots with it and I was able to take that Trader Joe's pizza dough and try them side by side. And what I was amazed and uh, again, knowing <laughs> with, with my experience with yeast and the impact on flavor, I was still amazed how much of a difference there was. Uh, albeit some of the ingredients in each were probably different, but at the base of it, it's just flour, water, and salt. And the dough that took three days to rise that used the uh, 518 uh, Hopeshaw Kavike Ale Yeast, which is a, a beer yeast, uh, had way more expression and complexity. Um, Skylar, did you want to kind of go through what our process looks like um, and the way we even cook it or maybe some suggestions that somebody could apply this at home? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this recipe in front of you is meant for the home cook. Uh, we wanted to kind of create this recipe so that people would feel really comfortable approaching it um, at their house. Uh, this recipe is a direct pizza dough. And at Kitchen and Tap, we actually use an indirect. So that means that we're using a poolish, which is uh, a starter um, in which we use the 518 yeast. Um, as far as Kitchen and Tap goes, we strive for Neapolitan style pizza. Um, we can't really claim Neapolitan because there's a lot of politics there, but um, we try and keep it as true to that style as possible. Um, our oven, runs at about 750 to 800 degrees. Uh, it's a wood-fired oven, so this is a really quick cook time. Uh, usually it takes 90 seconds for a pizza to go in and out of the oven. Um, so this recipe was designed more for somebody that has a pizza stone at home, and maybe they don't have a convection oven or a wood-fired oven, um, but it should act just about the same as if you did have a wood-fired oven at home. Awesome. Uh, and when we're looking at pizza dough uh, as a broad category, is it often that there's only very few ingredients in it or uh, are often people feeding it with a little bit of sugar or different types of flour? Uh, would there be any benefit to using different types of yeast strains in this? Uh, I know it took you guys a couple of years to really uh, lock on to the uh, 518 as opposed to the 644 Brux Lenses, uh, Saccharomyces Brux like Trois uh, that you were using before. So what was the, the thought process and the switch there? And what does some of the R&D look like on your end when, when finding the right strain for it? So it was kind of hard to find um, a yeast strain that would give it the rise that we would expect from just a commercial cake yeast. Uh, it's really fast and for our use in a restaurant, we need something really quick and consistent. Um, we found that in the 518 before we were using 001, 002, um, also some of the HEPA license. And we just found this one to give us the most consistent results under refrigeration. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's kind of a, it's a balance between creativity and economy of scale too. So it, Ideally, if time wasn't an issue or, you know, I understand uh, working in a restaurant that you're forecasting out how much you need of a certain thing and you're prepping what you think you're going to need two, three days from now. So if you're a, a homemaker, would you have any suggestions or any creative ideas or maybe things to do if time and money wasn't an issue? Absolutely. I would, um, I would make a bullish and incorporate that into the recipe. And what is, um, what is a poolish? As a... It's similar to a liquid Levan, but instead of going through the starting process, you know, which usually takes about five days, um, we're introducing the yeast directly. So we're getting kind of the same results, but it's going to taste a lot more like the yeast that we introduced right away, as opposed to depending on some of the, uh, the wild, you know, yeast and bacteria in the air. Um, I really liked the Hepalysins 
I think those yeasts really impacted the dough in a totally different way, similar to what you would get with the beer, a lot of banana and clove, um, some warmer spices. So that was my favorite test result, but um, found it took about two days extra for it to ferment to the point that we could have used it in the kitchen and tap. Yeah, how, uh, how would somebody at home be able to tell when it's done proofing? So that was one thing I struggled with. I've baked a decent amount, but usually it's, uh, you know, big, large loaves of bread um, where there, it tends to uh, it expand a lot and it tends to be a, a lot more CO2 buildup. And whereas the pizza dough had, uh, it was a lot denser. So how, how would somebody know when that is ready, when that dough is ready to be worked and thrown in an oven? Um, I go by the calling proof method, which I think a lot of people at home do. So the way that I think about it is a lot of people probably have a, a puffy down or north face jacket, something like that. Um, whenever you press into that jacket, you're kind of expecting the same result, a very slow yet firm rise from the indention of your finger. Um, so that's how I check my breads. Awesome. Uh, and, and Logan, I know you've experimented with some different yeast strains. Uh, what's your take on um, either the pizza dough specifically or maybe some different types of bread you've done uh, with lab cultured brewer's yeast? So, yeah, I typically like to use my sourdough starters any chance I can, but I've found that making a poolish with the 518 works so well for certain things. Like my baguettes, I make poolish. Um, and yeah, I think that it works a lot quicker and gets a faster rise. And so like, if I need to make something kind of on the faster side, I'll use Polish. And I also just like the flavor of that yeast strain. So certain times I'll even combine half sourdough starter and half Polish. Have you guys done anything fun with, um, any of the beers? I know we've done a lot of hazy IPAs with 518. Have you incorporated any of the beers into food or any of the doughs? I love to put beer in my desserts, um, especially like the Frankenstout. Anytime I make something with chocolate, I always add Frankenstout because I think it complements it so well. It's that kind of like bitter, funky, chocolatey, nutty. I think it just is begging to be paired with chocolate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you vinegar with the 004 porter um, and we use that for the fish and chips during our lunch menu so kind of so you're actually it. making the vinegar out of that beer yeah and are you just pouring uh, like a mother from a, a another vinegar into it is that how you're acidifying yeah. that I have a couple of uh, vinegar mothers stashed away but um, I like to reintroduce the same one to the same batch so cool yeah for a while we uh, in the lab, they, they broke down our um, SCOBY used to make a kombucha. And uh, there was some acetobacter, um, which is the primary organism that's create, you know, turning the ethanol to acetic acid or vinegar. Uh, and they were able to isolate that and prop a little bit up. So I took that home and had that, that going for a couple of years. And it was, it was pretty cool and geeky to say that this organism is part of this um, larger culture that we sell. And that was always a lot of fun. Um, we also, had a couple. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I've been super into lately using Saison instead of water in the sourdough bread. I think it just makes it so complex and adding Saison instead of water and then spent grain. It's just like so full of beer. Hmm. Could you do something like that with this pizza dough or would, it add, would the beer add too much flavor? I think it would be a great experiment, especially for people at home. Awesome. Uh, we've had a couple questions come in related to the, the topic we're on right now, but um, do you think that this process would work for Detroit or thicker style pizzas? Absolutely, yeah. We have a uh, Roman style pizza on right now. Um, so we, we find this dough is very versatile. Awesome. Um, can the dough be frozen? You can. I actually did, uh, during this pandemic, we did a test bake of a frozen pizza, uh, kind of attempting to see what 
would happen if we mimic some of the store-bought pizzas. Um, it turned out great. Um, we just let, we stretched the dough, uh, let it brew for about 30 minutes and then popped it in the freezer um, with sauce and cheese on it. And afterwards we pulled it out and baked it at 350 for about 10 minutes and it came out great. And awesome. the dough can also be baked as a loaf of bread and it, is, it comes out great. What uh, if you just have the dough sitting in your fridge, what's the general shelf life of something like that? Um, so we do a 72 hour ferment here at White Labs Kitchen and Tap. Um, I find after seven days of being bald, um, we don't really want to use it anymore. It starts to smell a little vinegary, smell a little boozy. Um, but I'd say five days max would be a good shelf life. Awesome. <clears throat> Uh, we've had a couple of questions roll in on the chat box. If you guys don't mind throwing that into the Q and A, it'll be easier for us to keep an eye on and, and uh, process. Um, so one thing that we always like doing, and I know you guys have both been part of it, is uh, what we call bite sized education internally, right? Where uh, we have different employees from different departments um, kind of just talk about either something they're working on or something they're passionate about. Uh, and Skylar, I think one of the first interactions that we had was um, maybe mid early last year when you did one on kimchi. And that was pretty cool that you were able to ship a lot out here and um, have everybody try it. Did you want to uh, kind of walk through that process pretty briefly um, and some, some tips and tricks that people should be looking at? What you guys do in house? Sure thing. Um, so the fermenting vessel that we use are actually vacuum seal bags. Um, we find that this is a really consistent result. Uh, that's kind of what we're about as a restaurant. We're looking for consistency. We don't really want anything that we didn't put in there floating around in there. Um, but I'll kind of go through some of the ingredients that we have in front of us. Uh, we have some ginger, scallion, uh, watermelon radish, shallots, dehydrated orange, lemongrass, uh, garlic, and fresh basil. Um, building on flavors, something that I have kind of figured out um, is charring uh, half of the ingredients and then leaving the rest of the ingredients whole. Hmm. So for things like the green onions, I'll do half, half of them charred or burnt and the other half fresh. And you can go all the way down the line with that and you'll get a really complex, um, bold, and deep flavor out of it. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It's very similar to building on flavors of, say, a soup, right? Uh, what does the actual fermentation look like? So how, I'm, I'm sure the vacuum sealing takes a lot of those flavors and concentrates them down. Um, but how long are you, how long and at what temperature are you uh, storing this until you are ready to put it on your menu? So I like to keep my ferments at around 70 degrees. Um, anything higher than 80 degrees is a little concerning because a lot of the bacteria in there is starting to get a little aggravated. Um, you don't want them to be frustrated. You want them to be happy and in a comfortable environment where they can't feed off a lot of those sugars. Um, the fermentation in the vacuum seal bags usually takes me about a week. Um, I like to let mine go for about two weeks though, because I kind of like that funk. I want those flavors to really develop. Um, usually these bags will inflate and sometimes depending on how much salt you put in, um, they'll explode. So I like to keep my kimchi a little bit saltier, um, somewhere between five and 7%. Okay. So to kind of inhibit, uh some of those organisms that might produce a lot of CO2. And what are, um, what are some other methods if you don't have a vacuum sealer? I know I've made sauerkraut before where there's different weights you can buy and um, you know, throw some cabbage on top. But if you don't have a vacuum sealer, how, how would you personally suggest uh, fermenting kimchi or sauerkraut? Uh, the way I do it at home actually is mason jar um, with an air seal lock. That works really well. And then I just make sure that um, 
pretty much anything in your house, a glass, a sterilized glass with water in it to weigh down. Um, that's kind of the way I do it there. Fermentation buckets work really well for home brewers. If you want to do a really big batch of kimchi or sauerkraut, mm -hmm. I kind of that works pretty yeah. well. Might, uh, might not be usable after for anything but kimchi, right. but <laughs> you yeah, have right. a bright red stained uh, fermentation bucket, but that'd be pretty cool. Hey, kimchi uh, here. That's my idea. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, people are, I talked to Richard about it. I give him a hard time about uh, brewing a lot of food beers. So sounds like it'd be up his alley. Uh, so what do you, what do you use it for on the menu? Uh, right now we have kimchi fries. A lot of people like those. That's um, a lunch menu item. And at night we actually just showcase the kimchi. So uh, the way I like to prepare my kimchi is you cut the cabbage heart into eighths. Uh, that way you have these really pretty long strips. Um, so at nighttime, we just roll that up and top it with a little toasted sesame and sesame oil. Uh, that way we can really let the, the fermented item shine. That sounds delicious. Uh, so we've got a lot of questions that we uh, will get to in just a moment, but um, just to kind of summarize everything else we spoke about, because this this conversation could obviously go on for hours, and um, hopefully we can set up another one of these soon. Uh, but you know, the big takeaway is that fermenting at home can be easy, fun, and tasty. Right? Uh, a big reason that I like fermenting foods uh, over beer sometimes, or uh, even you know, cider, wine, kombucha, is that it's the results are a little bit quicker. Um, we're talking about hours or days and if it doesn't turn out good i know pretty quickly whereas when i'm making beer you know it's weeks to a month before i realize if it turned out or not so the the immediate gratification of being creative um, i've always enjoyed um, in cooking uh, it's you know and you guys can uh, probably speak to this to no end but it's it, it's important to have a connection to your food right and i think people are really understanding that having more time at home and uh, having more mental capacity to get creative with their cooking and trying things that they've never tried before. It's uh, hopefully everybody comes out of this uh, situation that the, the whole world's in right now and wants to understand where their food comes from. I, I know I've had some friends that are all trying to get um, one of the CSA boxes and they're, these farms are all sold out and they can't get them every week because people are ordering um, local produce. Uh, have you guys, what's your take on the um, professional side of ingredient sourcing with this crisis going on? Have you, I know you guys work with a lot of um, local vendors. Have you seen any change in that? Uh, Asheville's been pretty good so far. Uh, we haven't seen a huge loss of food. Um, I know that everybody's kind of trying to keep their head above water and a lot of these smaller farms are already planted and ready to start providing produce to the area. So it's kind of difficult with them having a lot of vegetables around and restaurants really not being able to buy it because they don't have the business. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been, we've been trying to support who we can um, with the finances that we have. But Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, most importantly, hopefully we've, this conversation uh, has inspired people to try more at home uh, and tag us in your successes and failures and let us know uh, what, how creative you're getting and what different organisms you're working with, because it can obviously influence uh, maybe what you guys are doing, uh, seeing what kind of creative people are coming with. So white, at White Labs Yeast or White Labs uh, AVL on different platforms, um, Instagram, Facebook, all the usual uh, before we get to q and I just wanted to do a shout out because we've been working with the American Homebrewers Association. Um, again, a lot of people have been more interested in homebrewing with uh, more time on their hands. I know I pulled my system out uh, yesterday and I'll be doing my first batch of 2020 this weekend. But we've worked out um, with them. Um, if you join between April 15th and 22nd uh, with the promo code White Labs, you'll actually receive a free book of... Um, of the book yeast uh, by Chris White and Jamil Zanishev. So uh, really cool and cool tie in to our company. And uh, while it's primarily focused on brewing, there's a lot of 
uh, yeast handling and uh, chapters on metabolism that play a critical role in a lot of food fermentations. Um, so next week's um, Wednesday webcast is building a lab on a budget. So we're focusing again uh, more on the professional side. But with that said, uh, looking at a lot of tips and tricks anybody can um, do with minimal equipment, whether it's um, performing a forced diacetyl test, cell counting, um, just looking at the overall health of your yeast. Um, we'll be reviewing a lot of that. Um, so I'm going to pull up questions. We got quite a bit that rolled in. And again, I saw some come in through um, the chat function. So if you can use the Q&A for that, it'll be easier to, to organize. Um, are, can, for, for Logan, can you touch on any interaction between bacteria and yeast in a sourdough culture? So do you do you notice the microbiome of a culture start going in one direction or another? Um, it's pretty common in um, kombucha where a lot of kombucha makers really want to avoid a lot of yeast influence and, and want to keep the proportions of yeast down. Is that an issue in baking, uh, specifically sourdough cultures? Well, I've seen it as a good thing to have all the micro biomes in the air um, with my sourdough. So I haven't seen it as a problem. Cool. I kind of think the more funk, the better. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you ever had one that you needed to discard just because it didn't take off or the organisms didn't seem to do what they were intent, what you intended them to do? Yeah, I've had, I've definitely had some starters that flop, but um, sometimes you're able to revive them. I think just, like I said, paying attention and knowing what works, what doesn't, and just give it another chance. If it looks really loose or down in the dumps, if you just feed it and kind of give it some extra care, it usually will come back to life. And have you uh, added any brewer's yeast or lab grown bacteria into your starter and seen any results with that? Or are you just using all the wild microflora for the most part and keeping the poolish separate? I like to keep the poolish separate. Um, but I'll do half sourdough, half foolish for certain breads. And I really like the results of that. Awesome. So that's giving you a little bit more control over it rather than adding a lot of one organism to your uh, starter that might be a little more delicate. Right. And I saw someone um, asked a question on the White Labs Instagram page. If you can keep a poolish alive the same way you can keep a sourdough starter alive. And poolish typically only lasts about 16 hours versus sourdough starter can last a hundred years if you feed it properly. Hmm. So yeah, I like to keep yeast out of my sourdough just to keep it kicking. Right on. And uh, how do you guys, says how can you make your own vinegar at home? Um, well, one way is if you don't have a mother or a starter you're gonna to have to do that all by yourself. So a really good way, uh, fruit scraps and sugar and water. Uh, I definitely recommend using filtered water because there's a lot of stuff in our tap that isn't really good for us. So as well, it wouldn't really be good for the, uh, the microbes that are kind of floating around in there when you see the back here. Cool. Yeah, I've done, um, I've actually taken cider to um, cider vinegar from the whole process. So I've I did, um, I took some um, Martinelli's preservative free uh, apple cider and inoculated that with, uh, I think just some other from Bragg's or whatever the, the sprout store-bought apple cider is. And uh, no, so first I actually fermented it with an English yeast, I turned it into alcohol. And then I took some of that Bragg's and then did a secondary fermentation and turned that into vinegar. The whole process took about six months and uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. So it was, it was cool having that control. Um, are there any tips on troubleshooting a dough that isn't rising properly? Um, I would say make sure that your temperature is where it needs to be. It could be too cold or it could have gotten too warm and killed the yeast activity. So make sure it's in, I like to keep dough around 75 degrees. Um, just nice and warm and in a humid environment. Um, but yeah, I would say 
maybe the yeast died from either too cold, too hot, or it was just sitting for too long. And what are some other beers that you would use instead of water? Um, this specifically says for the pizza dough, but let's talk more broad with um, a lot of the different baked goods you guys are doing. I think the Saison works super well in place of water because it just has such an easy flavor to go with certain things. But really anything kind of hoppy and light, I think would work out well. I wouldn't try like a porter or a stout or anything dark. Do you think that would change the color of the dough if you used any beer? I think it would change the color. I think it would maybe get a little too bitter. And yeah, I, it's worth a shot, but. So the, the roasty so. malts might not, might not play super well with it. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be interesting. Versus in a chocolate cake, that is when you would want those flavors to come through. Cool. And then uh, why isn't the recipe in weight in baker's percentages rather than volume? So I think initially when we did that, it was just um, partially, you know, accessibility. Uh, but assuming you guys probably work in weight as opposed to volume for, for most of what you do. Yeah. Yeah. We wanted to um, just provide a really standard, good go-to recipe that was approachable for people at home. Um, most of the time, I know Logan follows a lot of her recipes by weight. Um, I follow a lot of my baking recipes by weight as well if I'm doing it at home. Um, but we just didn't want people to be intimidated that had never tried to make pizza dough at home or anything like that before. Yeah, and I'll, I'll see if we can um, add, add weight uh, when we are posting moving forward too because uh, it, it does make a lot more sense. You know, the the best examples, again, I don't, I don't bake too much, but I do a lot of barbecue. And when you're talking about... Um, volume a lot of the different sizes and salt so you know the really coarse salt compared to finely granulated salt the per the amount of salt is going to change quite a bit if you're working based off of volume so when you're salting a brisket that's eighty dollars um, being precise makes a, a pretty big difference so we'll see uh, to yeah to that question I'll, I'll work we'll all work together and see if we can um, add weights to everything we post uh, how do you char the veggies for the kimchi um, at home, I would usually use a cast iron. Uh, I would get that going really hot and um, just put them in there, let them do their thing. Uh, at the restaurant, we utilize our wood, wood fired oven a lot. So um, that kind of helps build on a lot of smoky flavors uh, that are in the kimchi here. Does fermentation stop or impart flavors of the temporize? Temps rise. Yeah, kind of going back to the bacteria in there. Um, the hotter it is, the more frustrated they are. I kind of, I, I've never really had great results from fermenting at higher temperatures. Um, if anything, I've really liked the results from fermenting at lower temperatures. I feel like they have a lot more time to spread out and feed on those sugars. Um, I guess kind of similar to how you would lager a beer. Um, can kind of apply the same principles to fermenting vegetables. Yeah, yeah, and that makes sense because generally with, uh, when we're talking about alcoholic fermentations, the warmer the temperature, the more flavor, right? That's not always a good thing. Um, it, it can create a lot more inconsistency. It could be undesirable flavors. Uh, a lot of yeast and bacteria want to be at those warmer temperatures, right? Um, most things do really well at room temperature, um, you know, say, 68 to 72 degrees uh, but if they're warmer they the organisms might be happier but not produce something that we want to consume um, especially in the, the case of uh, alcoholic fermentation so it's not very surprising with food fermentations as well it might go quicker um, and we've all seen that you know fermenting uh, different veggies during the summer as opposed to winter but the, the the timeline of that fermentation changes and the flavor profile changes quite a bit so um, how do you make the kimchi fries? That's the next question. Um, so we lactobacillus brine our French fries. Uh, that's the first step. Uh, after that, we top it with a yum yum sauce, which is kind of a shrimp sauce, very similar. Um, and then we have some braised brisket with a lot of hoisin sauce, uh, kimchi, uh, furikake, which is a rice seasoning, 
and green onions. But, awesome. but for the uh, fries, we introduce a small amount of the lactobrevis culture uh, to a brine, usually at room temperature. Um, pour it over the fries to make sure that they don't oxidize and usually let them sit for about 12 to 14 hours. Um, and the end result is awesome. It's really crispy outside and mashed potato on the inside. And are you deep frying those? Yes. So um, we pull them directly out of that brine, and blanch them uh, at a very low temperature in oil. Um, and this kind of helps break down or at least start the cooking process. Uh, we let those cool down and then once they're cool, we drop them right into the hot oil. Uh, if you don't do that, you're not gonna have very great results because the center of the French fry wouldn't have, not at the point where it's cooked all the way. Hmm. Are you using peanut oil for that or? Uh, we just use uh, soy oil here. Okay. I thought everybody in the South used peanut oil. I guess I'm wrong. <laughs> 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 oh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between the kraut and the chow chow? Just different seasonings or different brine percentages, different veggies involved? Uh, I think a lot of that is dealer's choice, but um, kind of looking back a little more traditionally, sauerkraut, super German, super simple. It's usually just caraway, salt, and shredded cabbage. Um, chow chow. Most of the time it's pickled, but uh, I kind of like to think of that as more of like a sour pickle. So the fermentation aspect and chow chow, I guess in a, like Appalachian culture is basically whatever you have laying around. So this can be cabbage hearts that, you know, didn't cut it to make it to the sauerkraut, carrots, tomatoes, onions, garlic, whatever spices you have on hand, whatever herbs you have on hand. I've seen so many varieties of chow chow. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, very consistent with the regionality of sauerkraut and kimchi too, right? Uh, historically, it's just what was available and probably what was affordable uh, as a way of preserving it and making a lot of flavor for probably a very flavorless diet. It's, it's interesting to see how many ingredients and foods we have available now, whereas 50, 100 years ago, uh, you couldn't get fruit every, you know, throughout every month of the year. You, you couldn't get a lot of that stuff. Um, and let alone, we um, probably weren't very adventurous um, eat eaters too. So that's cool. Uh, would you be willing to share your sourdough starter yeast chocolate chip cookie recipe? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I can put that on the, put that on the website. Yeah, it sounds like we're going to need to start doing a... Um, <laughs> It'll change your perspective of the chocolate chip cookie forever. <laughs> Tyler likes to have one with a glass of milk in the afternoons. <laughs> uh, what other flours can be used for the pizza dough? Uh, we use double zero flour, which is the finest milled flour that you can get. Um, so this is really, I guess, helps homogenize the pizza dough. Um, and we also use a little bit of rock. Um, at home, I've had some really awesome results with pumpernickel rye, um, and we're currently working on trying to get some uh, local different varieties of flour in. So looking forward to trying maybe some einkorn and just whole wheat. Cool. We've got just a couple more minutes and still quite a bit of questions. So I'm going to um, pick through a couple. Uh, so can you give a modified pizza dough recipe using Poolish? Um, we've had limited success with Voss. Kvike, uh, but it didn't rise as much as we were expecting. So the, the first uh, suggestion for that would be to try the, the 518 Opshog Kvike Ale Yeast. Uh, obviously, it's what the, the um, recipe is designed around, and we've had a lot of success. Um, but any other suggestions about using a, a Poolish with it for the, the home maker? So when I'm using Poolish here, um, we have a proof box, and so I'll mix the Poolish and then stick it in the proofer for about an hour and then it's nice and jiggly and bubbly and you can tell that it's ready to go um, but you can also do it at home without a proof box or any sort of warm vessel you could let it sit for up to 16 hours but i would say just to make sure that your poolish activity level is there before you mix your dough cool i would also uh, say, um 
if not sure if you did this or not, but uh, autolyzing your dough, um, mixing everything but the salt together and letting it kind of bulk ferment for about 30 minutes um, and then mixing the salt in on low in your mixer. Um, this kind of helps promote yeast growth within that dough because uh, the salt is going to inhibit it from growing. Cool. And that is um, in the full recipe that we will post. That is one of the steps. So um, have we done any characters this sequencing of the wild stuff in Logan starter, for example, to see what organisms are present? So uh, we haven't yet, but that's something we were just talking about that would be really cool. Uh, as yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, we have done it with our, our SCOBY, um, and it was really cool to see what organisms were present there, but I think the next step is to look at some of the uh, cultures that you guys have come up with and try to break them down, and uh, I've, you know, I myself and a, a lot of other people here for years have been saying it would be cool if uh, we did a commercial um, for, you know, food fermentation, bacteria, wild yeast blend, and uh, that would be pretty neat. And, you know, maybe that's something you guys can start working on. Yeah. Um, I know we've gotten a couple questions on if you'd be able to rewatch it. And the answer is yes. Um, it will probably take us a couple days to process the video, but we've been posting everything to our YouTube page. And you can actually go back and see the last couple uh, Wednesday webcasts as well. So we hope those will live up there. Uh, for a long time to come. Uh, what are some good, so I've got two more. Uh, what are some good sauces that you can use making fermentation? Uh, have you ever fermented ketchup or anything? Soy um, sauce would be an obvious one, right? Yeah, soy sauce, Osco. fish sauce. That one can be a little scary and unapproachable to some people. Uh, I currently have some fish sauce working right now. So if we do this again, I'll share the results. Um, <laughs> actually fermented a pizza sauce before. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, other than that, I mean, you can turn pretty much anything fermented into a sauce. So uh, we've pureed our kimchi before and mixed that into some stuff. That's been really cool. And your romesco cool. is fermented, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, we fermented red peppers and made a, a fermented red pepper romesco out of that. So that was really awesome. I had a lot of a lot of tang and a lot of depth. Cool. Um, last question is where can I buy your lactobacillus? So um, all of our yeast and bacteria are available uh, for homebrew scale at your local homebrew retailer. Uh, I would look at beer homebrewing. Uh, it's generally where the organisms are marketed to and you should be able to find it. There's a lot of uh, online retailers right now too that are able to ship uh, knowing that people are in lockdown. Uh, but I wanted to thank you guys for coming on and doing this. I feel like it was uh, pretty awesome and long overdue uh, to start showing off to a broader audience of uh, what you guys and what the geeky things are going on in there. Because a lot of times people might think it's just a, a regular brew pub with, you know, burgers and sandwiches. But you guys have been killing it for a long time. And I'm always happy to um, eat there when I get the chance. Thanks. Thank cool. you. Yeah, Thanks thank you. That. And if anybody has additional questions, uh, my email, uh, efowler at whitelabs.com, should be sent along with all the, uh, the correspondence. And then um, I can loop uh, Logan and Skylar into it as well, and we can keep the conversation going. But be on the lookout um, in the next couple of days for the recording of this, as well as updated recipes. And we'll continue to update them uh, as we can scale them down and, and make sure they're tasty at home as much as they're in the restaurant. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.